Hello, can you hear me? Test. Professor Taleb, good afternoon. Hello from Kiev. Thank you for joining us. We are setting things up um, and we will start shortly. Thank you very much for being with us. Um, I will, as usual, I will just introduce you to the audience and I uh, I, have I think this is recorded, so I would I would uh, just to let you know. Oh yeah, yeah, we will cut everything away, which is not relevant. We will start at seven oh, o'clock, okay. and uh, our administrator room four zero eight is our IT specialist. He will um, I, I see. He will handle these things. But I just wanted I agree. to. Use, I have a question. Uh, how long is the, the? Okay, so I'm going to speak for about thirty minutes, plus or minus five or ten. 
But uh, and then we have Q and A. How long would that last? One hour in total. I I would go for one hour in total. We don't want to you know take a lot of your time. Uh, no, no, and also the the if we dilutes if it's too long, fewer people will watch it later. So it's better mm -hmm. to have it compact. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, we will try to make it compact. Um, and also, to be perfectly honest with you, um, I don't know how many people will show up. I hope for uh, our students to show up, but they are volunteers. They are working now very hard. Some we of already them... have 130 people, 140 people. Okay. So it is increasing. Oh, I, I, it is increasing. Good, good. That's good. And we we circulated it in our circles, so yeah. Okay, people are saying hello. So that's good. I will start uh, in two minutes at seven o'clock, uh, presenting you officially, and I will pass the, the word to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Before you start, let me test the share screen. It does work. It works. Yeah, we had 180. It's moving. Great. Thank you very much to everyone who is watching us online. My name is Timo Fibrik. I'm broadcasting from Kiev, the capital city of Ukraine. This is day number one of uh, number eight, I'm sorry, day number eight of war uh, in Ukraine of the Russia's invasion. Even though I'm in Kiev and I'm relatively safe, I stay here in, in my shower, which is my urgent shelter. Uh, this is the closest uh, where I can go. I highly recommend to all Ukrainians and Ukrainian students who are watching us to move to their shelters and safe places. Even though I'm in Kyiv and I'm safe, we're reading news about combats and uh, uh, battles in other cities in Ukraine, including uh, the city of Energodar, were nearby one of the largest nuclear power plants in Europe. And not only we Ukrainians are watching this news, the whole world is, is watching. So in, uh, in this sending solidarity to Ukraine. And in this solidarity, we also have uh, a very uh, prominent speaker today, Nassim Nicholas Taleb. We are very honored to have him as a guest speaker. Uh, we, I already see that we have uh, a worldwide audience, uh, but uh, I'm also especially pleased that our students of Kiev School of Economics and our alumni can listen to this lecture. Uh, Professor Taleb is a man who needs no introduction. I will say only a few words um, that Nassim Nicholas Taleb, uh, well, he's of course the leading world intellectual. Uh, he is the author of multi-volume essay called the Incerto, which includes his famous books, The Black Swan, Fooled by Randomness, Antifragile, and Skin in the Game. Um, he will present his lecture today. He will be speaking about 30 minutes. And then I will um, moderate your uh, Q&A session. I will read your questions from uh, comments here. 
but also I will be watching Facebook um, translation, uh, sorry, broadcasting, which is online right now. Um, Professor Taleb, thank you very much. Uh, I will pass the word to you, please. The, this virtual uh, floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I'm extremely honored I mean, to be called uh, upon. I mean, I, I guess you guys have other things to do than listen to lecture. So, but nevertheless, life needs to continue. Um, and and I was I've, I spent my childhood in a civil war, so I know what it is. I know how it feels, and I know that you want to normalize as much as you can, while maximizing your safety. And uh, so, good luck. My heart goes with Ukraine, and I was there last summer, where uh, you know I saw everybody, spoke to everybody, talked to the Zelenskys, uh, both of them, uh, very impressive, and. Uh, <laughs> And here we go. I'm back, but uh, from a back door. Incidentally, I um, boycotted. Uh, I was first among the first boycotts uh, the, with the first day of invasion. Uh, a lecture I was supposed to give today in Krasnoyarsk. So Russia, it was supposed to be physical and then online. And then the minute the, 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 uh, the aggression started, uh, said okay niet kaput okay so i an honor to the ukraine because i really believe in people deciding their own fate nobody should tell you whether you're russian or prussian or whatever it is you decide so it's like a belgian person can decide to be french or can decide to be whatever they want okay it's it's your nobody can coerce you into an identity particularly an archaic uh, identity so uh, thank you very much for uh, support. So this lecture, I'm going to share screen, and this lecture is going to be a little technical in the beginning, but, not, but but you're going to see why. It's just one function, convexity, and then I'm going to apply it to a lot of things, including what's happening in the Ukraine, or including what happens uh, to things after shock. Uh, the, uh, so let me, let me start with uh, introducing myself, okay? Uh, sorry, no, no. So let me introduce myself. Okay, so I'm the author, as you said, of the Incerto. I don't like to be associated with any of the members of the Incerto because they address the same uh, problem, but they cover uh, most of it. The best, you know, the most known is uh, the Black Swan on some classes of uncertainty. Um, I had a little a bit of reverse. Um, I would say a curse, you know, because so uh, the, 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 the path I followed is in reverse typically because my origin is a trader and, and actually I was even a pit trader. So my, 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 when people tell me, Hey, what, what's your identity? I started as a trader doing mathematical stuff, but I was my own mathematician as a trader. And then, and then I started doing this kind of stuff. <laughs> so research in retirement. And the first idea that came to me when I retired from trading is the idea of, um, of fragility and anti-fragility, because once you map fragility, we're going to focus on mapping fragility, you can understand anti-fragility. Uh, also, uh, I mean, most of my uh, research focuses around uh, what I call fat tails, uh, what, what, what uh, uh, thick tails, fat tails, uh, heavy tails. Um, what happens when uh, a certain environment is dominated by an extreme? It's a winner take all. And uh, the two fattest tail variables you can find on planet Earth are wars and pandemics. Okay, so, <laughs> so, here, so this is very cogent for someone in Ukraine who has witnessed both at the same time. Uh, we had probably a mild pandemic and hopefully we'll have a mild war, but it's dominated in history. In other words, if you take the fat tail means if you take uh, the 100,000 technology stocks that have existed in history, you'll notice that maybe uh, uh, four or five would represent uh, half the total return. See, if, if you take uh, the wealthiest person today in, in America, he or she would be wealthier, regardless of when, today, tomorrow, would be wealthier than the bottom three billion taken together. So that's concentration. And that concentration affects random variables and requires a certain form of analysis. So this is what I'm focusing on. We're doing research papers. 
of course, uh, got involved in pandemics because they're driven by tail events and, um, and, and of course, wars. <laughs> and people couldn't believe that uh, the world was not getting safer. I said, OK, of course, it's a fat tail variable. You need a much larger sample. You need 100, 200 more years to really figure out this world has gotten safer. So uh, when I stopped trading, <laughs> I decided to have a life, you know, as a researcher. You know, when you trade, it's pretty much like being in war. It's too much, too tiring. So your brain doesn't work fully. You're focused on one thing. Uh, the You can't do it halfway. You, you got to really, it absorbs you at night, during the day, everything, even weekends. So when I stopped trading to do research, the first thing that came to me I was when I was looking at a coffee cup, I said, well, now I know why this coffee cup is fragile. Why is it fragile? Because it's not linear to shocks. So let's say you, uh, Timofey, you jump uh, one meter, right? You're going to get probably stronger jumping one meter, okay? Okay, you do that 10 times. It's okay, you can jump one meter 10 times. But definitely jumping one meter 10 times is different from jumping 10 meters once. You agree? Okay, jump. Some meters once it'd be like uh, you know what the Russians want you to do. I hope you're not very high on, in floors because, <laughs> in case there is a, you have to rush out. So, I discovered one thing that for the fragile shocks bring higher and higher harm as intensity increases. So the average doesn't doesn't matter. So if I sub submit the coffee cup or this glass to a shock of three, ten times it doesn't break. You see, one time say at shock of 3.4, whatever, you know, I'm just inventing, you know, for the sake of the discussion, the Gedanken experiment. So at 3.4, it breaks. So the average doesn't count. You see, you have it when you have a threshold. And uh, as you see here, you have a do do dose response, okay, where nothing happens, nothing happens, and a lot happens. So if you do an average of, uh, say, uh, sorry, say here, three, and uh, and uh, an eight uh, uh, or three, sorry, or you can do two and six, okay? Uh, you can do two, if you do three, it doesn't get harmed. If you do two and six, well, for an average of three, it gets harmed. So you have nonlinearity coming from that. And this is necessary. Everything alive today is fragile at some point to a certain class of shocks. And let me give you the, 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 the rationale. If you're linear in harm, not non-linear in harm like here, but linear in harm, okay, you would, and, and you were harmed by one time 10 meters, the same as two times five meters, the same as 10 times one meter, okay, you would be dead because basically just walking around Kiev, okay, would kill you. <laughs> just a little shock, the accumulation of shocks. So we are not linear to harm. So the small shocks don't matter. As a matter of fact, they help you. But the big shocks harm you. Okay, disproportionately. Well, this has a lot of consequences. So I start obsessing over this. And because my profession as a trader was basically this, doing working with, uh, with these, uh, uh, you know, random variables that, that have second order effects and, and constructing packages like options of, on which later that have this payoff. How will this lead us to, you know, how people get better under uh, stressor? We'll, 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 that will come. So second order effect matter a lot without getting into the, the math. But so the idea to understand why averages don't matter is the distribution around the average matters a lot. In English, it's don't cross a river that is on average four feet deep. But translated into French is a convex function of an average is not the average of a convex function. <laughs> so, so that's the uh, the main uh, th that's so the main idea. For example, an exam uh, uh, if you uh, smash someone with this big stone, she or he will die. But if you break it up in small pedals, not a problem. So there are nonlinearities coming from size that we cannot ignore. So this sort of like was part of my profession as an option trader. Realizing that companies, uh, they seem very stable under small stressors, but in, if they have acceleration of harm, it will show later on. 
So they, they so for example, uh, you're much more vulnerable, disproportionately vulnerable to large deviation. Some companies, and this is what I, uh, you know, uh, is what I declare this fragile. Fragile is something disproportionately uh, nonlinear in harm, and 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 there's practically nothing on earth that is nonlinear in harm. <laughs> Everything is, I will see from medicine is linear in harm. So, as you can see here, for example, just to have nonlinearity, you can observe it. Uh, from nonlinearity, is an elephant looks like a mouse. I mean, I don't know why you would find cuter an elephant or a mouse. Uh, I think I prefer the elephant. The elephant is metabolically uh, uh, more efficient. The elephant is uh, is uh, has a heartbeat of something something like forty beats per minute. The small mouse, the Tuscan shrew, has two hundred fifty uh, beats per minute. It's not efficient. The the elephant lives 50, 60, 70 years. M mice live a couple of years, two three years. Okay, so so you would think there'd rather be an elephant in life than a mouse. No, because if an elephant falls just a little bit, it breaks a leg. It's gone. Where the mouse know, and you can see it at their legs. Disproportionately, the main difference between them is that as you grow in size, you get disproportionately have you have nonlinear effect on how much larger your footprint needs to be. So, I'm giving this example just to, to give you that if we follow the logic, the reason behind the fall of large empires centralized large empires because they they cannot tolerate shocks as easily as small units just like a mouse versus an elephant and this we know from the physical uh, uh, attribute of the system so that for example a tall tower is much more fragile than a lot of houses okay disproportionately more fragile so it costs a lot more in the reinforcement and this I got as an option trader discovering this convexity okay an option is something that has a strike price, and then when you see this nonlinearity, there's this non this curve, and uh, and uh, as an option trader, I'd rather have the market and half the time at eighty, half the time at one twenty, rather than once on uh, all the time at uh, hundred. And to give you an idea how this maps into medicine, you know the lung ventilator that became publicized during COVID. Uh, it was discovered that. Uh, if you supply someone 100% of, uh, you know, whatever they need in oxygen, uh, they end up not, not surviving, you know, um, they have a poor survival rate. But you improve the survival rate uh, very much by giving them half the time 80%, half the time 120% of, of the average they need. And, and that, they did better. So they are in a way, what I call convex to uncertainty. Convex to uncertainty is very simply. You'd rather have half the time less, half the time more than 100% of the time the same amount. And if you are convex to uncertainty, you are anti-fragile over that span, okay? And if you are uncertainty, randomness, variability, and if you are concave, okay, you are fragile, okay, over that span. So. By theorem, I started working on, on papers, and you can basically, uh, there, there's a cluster we call the Disorder Brothers, okay? If you like one, you like them all. So if you like variability, you like stressors, up to a point, okay? If you like, uh, 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 you know, uh, randomness, you like entropy, of course, and you like time. <laughs> this does not like time because it doesn't like volatility. If I leave it on a table over time, eventually some event will happen that will break it. It's nonlinear to harm. So this nonlinearity is explained. I mean, I, I don't want to bug you too much. Incidentally, you can either get this book for free, downloaded, uh, I'll give you the link, or you can Google it, you'll find the link. Everything is for free. Or you can probably get, but don't tell my publisher, Antifragile for free somewhere. If you don't, <laughs> let me know. Uh, but if you live in Kiev, of course. Uh, but the ideas are explained in a lot of scientific papers um, and, and in, of course, anti-fragile, what, what I'm going to talk about. So that some, some things like randomness and variability. Now, this is, again, convex or concave. If you're convex, you like half the time 80, half the time 120 rather than... Uh, you know, all the time, uh, 100 and vice versa. 
And this is a great way to understand the difference, okay? That if you're complex. Uh, conversely, I can say if you have a, a curve, if uh, for say an event up 10%, you make more money in the markets, that's what an option does, then you lose if the market goes down 10%, you are convex. And if you lose 10%, <laughs> you know, you lose more at down 10%, then you, get, you are concave. That's basically one way to view it. In the long run, if you're convex and you don't pay for it, you're going to do very well. We'll on that later. So now let's look at medicine. <laughs> Life is nothing but an S-curve in medicine. Everything that has a floor is a convex from a floor. And everything that has a ceiling is concave to the ceiling. Okay, everything is an S-curve in medicine, all right? Or what I call the more complicated S-curve, where you may have the S-curve that's green, or an S-curve that goes up like, I want to have chocolate, and then, but you saturate, okay? But if you keep going, you don't just saturate, you die because too much is poisonous. So this is very important because you can see here exactly the administration, why the administration of 8120 is better when you have concavity uh, in, for example, for lung uh, respirators, but you can also understand uh, intermittent fasting. Over a span, it's better to eat uh, 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 zero calories uh, one day and uh, 4,000 calories the next day than 2,000, 2,000, okay? Uh, or, or at some span, all right? So also you can understand very well why the dose, uh, dose response in chemotherapy, for example. There's actually a bunch of doc A lot of people have cited medicine in medicine, but there are a bunch of people working on dosage using the, the nonlinear curve. The more technical work is on associating the local nonlinearity with uh, with uh, the response to uh, volatility. Okay, so so you have that. So why is this important? It's important to say that over some range of variation, we like stressors. But it's going to get worse. <laughs> you like stressors, but hey, no, we need stressors in some situation because we are made for stressors. It's sort of looking at all these stories of evolution, but from second order effect. So saying, oh, we need water. I say, no, we need this supply of water. For example, a lot of people do analysis first order effect. They say, well, the Cretan diet is good. Now, why is a Cretan diet good? Well, you look, the Cretans live longer. Okay, that's very nice. And they eat fish and a lot of tarama and a lot of hummus and a lot of, uh, okay, so let's, let's eat. No, you idiots. They eat, okay, they they have 200 they're orthodox i am orthodox i'm sure many people in ukraine are orthodox and you know there's prost <laughs> fasting where they eat absolutely no animal product for 205 or 210 days a year okay so they are so and then they eat like uh, you know the meat like crazy on some days so they're infrequently uh, fed meat which, and we know that if you constantly have a stressor of having meat all the time without resting, you don't do as well as having meat occasionally, okay? Uh, you don't even need the same quantities. That's sort of like this nonlinearity that we're exploring in, in medicine, particularly in, 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 uh, in oncology. But also you can apply it to nutrition, to a lot of things. <laughs> How diabetes comes more, more the result of constant feeding, and the the, the, basically, you, you don't experience hunger. Hunger has some effect. Um, the, the, the Soviet Union had, uh, in its day, uh, a lot of research on uh, fasting, where they put someone in a Siberian uh, Lake Baikal, I think, and some institute, so they, 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 they stopped feeding them for 40 days, just give them water <laughs> on water fast. So, so they studied these, but all these fall into this f uh, framework of analysis of finding local nonlinearities whether you like intermittence or you like uh, uh, constancy. So, uh, hence, anti-fragile. Anti-fragile is basically when you like volatility over, over a certain period. And if you like volatility, as I said, you like the shock up to some amount, okay? And, uh, and, and well, the converse is if you're anti-fragile, it means that in your history, you're made for that kind of shock and you don't get it, well, you get in trouble, okay? This is why we're made, you know, to exercise because our bones don't respond uh, and our bones and our muscles don't respond to just nutrition or uh, respond to stressors. You stress your bone, it gets stronger. 
you stress your uses why people go to the gym <laughs> up to a point of course you, you know you don't want to stress too much but there's the deprivation of this uh, uh, if you're convex to something it means you need it nature made you that way uh, even for a long time when I wrote anti-fragile first people didn't talk about heart rate, heart rate variability and and I realized I mean, in the beginning I was wondering you know uh, why do people want steadiness and effectively there's a research start, that started to show when I wrote anti-fragile that basically the best predictor of deaths of anyone is when your heart rate is, is too regular it means you're not responding to the environment very well and, and, and sure enough, now people use heart rate variability as an indicator of health rather than, than disease, whereas in the past they were trained that way. So we can look at things that require stressors and this cluster of things, that, what I call the disorder brother, in uh, uh, two categories, on the main difference between a cat and a washing machine. So I'll, now I'll focus on the benefits of uncertainty if you read it well and anti-fragile doesn't mean jump out of the window it means jump one meter <laughs> okay so the cat what's the difference the cat and between the cat and the washing machine is that the washing machine if you give it stressors okay it breaks whereas a cat if you stress it uh, it, gets, it, it may get better up to a point so the the everything organic communicates with the environment via stressors like I, now I'm pale because I haven't seen the sun. I go in the Mediterranean sun. I will darken as protection from further sun. But I can't darken just by thinking about it. Okay, the, the, We are built in a way to respond to environments. So we're part of a e complex ecosystem that requires these, uh, this transfer of information via stressors. Whereas here, the, the washing machine, you stress it, it won't get better. So hence, there is a big central mistake that I've been fighting f for all my life particularly in finance, is that they think that lowering risks comes from lowering variability. No. You don't lower your risk by lowering variability. You lower the risk by lowering the tail risk, what I call for extreme events, and embracing some amount of variability that makes things better. So which is why directed economies don't do as well as free economies because they embrace the variability. For example, uh, America has the highest bankruptcy rate in the world, and it's the most dynamic economy. And people would rather uh, go live in America than China or Soviet Union, former Soviet Union, okay? So, or, or Russia, for example. So why? Because there is some kind of disorder, but there's a good disorder. We have the highest rate of bankruptcy in the world, and within America, the highest rate of bankruptcy is in the technology sector, which is the most dynamic. So you realize that making things steady doesn't work very well. Now it comes to something, uh, basically when, when, when I was asked to talk to Kiev, about Kiev, I'm going to tell you my own experience. And this will, I hope, uh, to, uh, Timothy and people in Kiev will understand. All my life as a, you know, outside the Lebanon, of course, uh, I, I've heard about uh, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. That people say, oh, people who witness wars have a post-traumatic stress disorder. I said, what the hell is talking about? I witness wars, and I'm certain that I got better out of it, from it. Okay. Well, it turns out that there's something called post-traumatic growth. Okay. Whatever it doesn't break, of course, it can break you. A lot of people get traumatic stress disorder. But bad events make people grow. I mean, up to a point, of course, bad events uh, it can't be, you know, something that, that kills you doesn't make you grow. But so so there's something called post-traumatic growth and psychologists don't talk about it. All they talk about is disorder and, and the idea that nobody's going to make any money selling you, uh, you know, uh, post-traumatic growth. They, they give you, uh, you know, because they don't have to treat you. Nature is treating you. Okay, well, psychologists make money giving you advice on your post-traumatic disorder. So they like to put disorders. And and the whole attitude I have towards medicine and everything, is person anti-fragile is when I'm very sick, I don't go to the doctor. I go to four doctors. And if I'm mildly sick, I go to no doctor. You see, so, so basically I overreact. So this is what people didn't get with COVID. I react to pandemics monstrously, but I don't react to small little... Uh, deviations so and then of course the anti-fragile a lot of people upregulate on the stressor 
that's a post-traumatic growth. In other words, if you need stressors, you must get your stressors. So you know they're going to be wind. And there's an expression in, uh, in the States, when life gives you a lemon, you make lemonade. So, so you try to make, you know, and, and, and of course, the only way to make lemonade is lemon. And lemon in, is in, in English or in slang means a mishap. Okay. So when you have a mishap, I don't know how it translates into Ukrainian, but <laughs> the idea is that you know there's going to be a lot of wind. So either you go to the basement and start crying and ask for government money, all right, or there's going to be a lot of wind. You say, oh, I'm going to make some money out of it. <laughs> Big wood bills. So the, 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 that's uh, the, the main one. And, and if you look at the history of, of civilization and countries, you see a parameter. A little bit of stressor has caused a lot of people to do very well. I think the most successful country in history, Singapore, they have no resources. So when you don't have resources, you tend to upregulate. The Phoenicians had no resources that so forced them to, you know, become merchants and one thing leads to another. So it gets you out of the, the, lethar, the you know, lethargical states. And you look at Saudi Arabia, they have all the resources and look what they've done with them compared to Singapore. So you realize that uh, in history, uh, it's good to be small for reasons of scale. Uh, as, as you see, scale is nonlinear, and it's also good to have no resources. <laughs> so, the the uh, you, in, in other words, it's like Venice. You turn water into gold. You, you force so you upregulate. You say a little bit of a shock makes you better. Let, that's the idea. Just like I lift weight, I upregulate. You see, I get the stressor, I upregulate. And sometimes, uh, companies a little bit of chaos in companies help them improve okay it doesn't destroy them help them improve and sometimes some companies even create their own uh, chaos and and let me tell you one thing the best predictor of a bankruptcy of a company is steady earnings because it means they're not adapted to to the environment okay it's just like steady heart rate and uh, and for an individual if you have a steady salary it destroys you okay whereas uh, i compare two brothers one had uh, it was on a salary. The other one was an entrepreneur, and and you see them. They, they were making the same amount of money, but the other one was, ironically, a lot more resistant. Or they say fluctuatnik megitur in Latin, fluctuate. But if you fluctuate, the more you fluctuate without thinking, the more robust you are as compared to something that's steady. And the best predictor, actually, of a hedge fund that's going to collapse is steady earnings. It means they're taking a lot of hidden risk. And of course, the American economy uh, proved to be anti-fragile from this. And evolution, basically, is the mother of all gainers of convexity because it, it, it benefits from optionality. And let me show how this adaptation mechanism works. Um, if you, uh, it's simple, if you, uh, uh, let's say you make mistakes in if you have parthenogenesis, in other words, you don't have a uh, sexual reproduction, but you reproduce yourself. If you reproduce yourself exactly as you are, without variation, uh, it's not gonna do, you're not going to do very well. The environment may change, you won't survive. If you make mistakes and you reproduce yourself into many kids, once in a while, it's sort of like a fax machine that makes a mistake. <laughs> okay. A, printing mistakes or produces a slightly different organism. So if you if it doesn't work, so what? If it benefits, it gets better. So so the, the best way is to make small mistakes, but not too many. Because if you if you reproduce with too much variation, then you won't retain the benefits of previous adaptations. So you need to have a small rate of mistake. Okay. Uh, and, and, and of course, uh, when you have sexual reproduction, you still, you have a lot of kids, you have variation between them. You don't want to be, them to be too far apart genetically, but you don't want to be too close. Okay. You want them to be, to have dispersion so some would survive. So finally, now let me talk about what my idea of black swan of high unpredictability. The, the way to navigate uncertainty is via what I call anti-fragile payoffs, payoffs that have small downside, big upside, and how this links to this whole story. Uh, this, as we can see in front of us, is commonly known as the wheel. 
invented about 6,000 years ago, but look how long it took to figure out how to put, uh, I know you guys are probably too young to observing to remember the days when I was carrying suitcases without a wheel. And believe me, it ain't funny carrying suitcases like that. You're, uh, you need a trolley, you can't find a trolley. You need the, in the old days, you had to have to put a dollar in the machine and the machine would never, it never work. Okay. So the, the, Carrying this in April, this small technological thing to go from the wheel to this, okay, it took 6,000 years. So, so you would say, okay, it's very hard to have that idea. Uh, likewise, people built these pyramids in uh, Central America without, uh, without the wheel. You'd think so. No, they had the wheel, but they used it for toys. So our imagination is not good enough for us to figure out what's happening. But when you have a convex payoff where you have more upside than downside by tinkering, then you can, uh, that can approach things. So what I call the philosophical stone is as follows. I'd rather be anti-fragile than smart. So in other words, have more upside. So let's say you make an error, it costs you a dollar, okay? Or you make an error, or it makes you two dollars, all right? So that's your convex error. Okay, half the time you lose, but you lose a little. Half the time you make, but you make bigger. So you're anti-fragile to ours. Actually, you don't even have to be right half the time. You can be maybe right one in a hundred. Okay, that's the tinkering trial and error. And, and, and we don't have the imagination to understand the world far ahead uh, very well. But by tinkering, we can we can understand what's going on. So let me stop and sort of summarize and link to the situation. You, you're living difficult times. I went through that, I tell you, and believe me, think of post-traumatic growth. That will cheer you up. Uh, I, I mean, I, our war in Lebanon lasted my child, I mean, a great part of my life. And, you know, it lasted uh, more than a decade. And it was really completely met because it was still within neighborhoods. <clears throat> and uh, and, and you, as you can see, we're familiar to that. And uh, uh, the, the bad guy, you know, you, you never know who the bad guy is because uh, uh, things turn. <laughs> okay. So, uh, but, but so, so try to say, okay, this is going to make me tougher on this, tougher on this. It helps a little, of course. And of course, you have to fight. It upregulates things. Um, an army that haven't seen a war like these Russians uh, probably are not going to do very well, <laughs> particularly that they don't have skin in the game fighting, you know, in a, a remote place from their place of origin, uh, populations who live there and, and, and cares about it. Anyway, so, but in general, I said how we can go from a concept of fragility, this is fragile, to nonlinearity, to everything nonlinear, either loves or hate volatility within that, uh, within a range. And to why we need volatility within our range, why we go to the gym, it's the same idea, why we need stressors once in a while, all kinds of stressors. And, uh, and you can generalize to many, many things. Okay, but, but uh, upregulating is, is, is something that people underestimate. But let me tell you one thing. I remember during the war in Lebanon, what, was, what struck me the most is that I was stuck like you, you're hiding now, is you want normalcy, but then you read voraciously. See, because at the time there was no internet, and, uh, and I hope you keep the internet, and I'm sure Elon Musk will help to make sure it still works, but th there, was, there was basically no internet in my childhood. But so we had books, okay, and you create books, and, and, and it made me, you know, it made me love literature, love books, just being stuck in that, that hiding in, in, in that underground uh, for months and months on end. Anyway, so... Uh, Thank you very much, and uh, as you say, Slava Ukraina. And uh... Aaron, Slava. <laughs> um, thank you, thank you very much for the lecture. Stop. Let me stop and, and take the Q and A. Sure. Uh, yeah, well, thank you both, and for the lecture, and for your you know kind words in the beginning and in the end. Uh, we have uh, a lively chat where people usually say hello and the country they're from. And they, there are several questions in Q and A, um, and I guess I will I will read uh, some. I will prioritize those that are related to you know current events, and then I will read others. 
Um, and there is one question which is very straightforward. You know, there is one person, Augustine, who says uh, that we must understand that Ukraine is fighting the enemy that has his finger on the red button. Uh, we are under the threat of getting the big shock as Putin is able to drop a nuclear bomb. Um, so what do we do in these circumstances? Okay, uh, you, uh, let me let me uh, okay l l let me uh, talk about the uh, the no everybody's in the West is is scared of the following uh, idea. Let's think about it. He who pushes the red button in Moscow is going to be dead. So, so you realize what they'll be doing is suicide. So you hope, and then the other thing is, it's more than one person involved in pushing that button. Okay, so uh, you, you get the idea. So he who pushes that button knows, he or she knows that it's 100% suicide. Okay, so uh, and that was the idea that prevailed, the mutually assured uh, destruction. But now, one thing is that we know that uh, Mr. Putin, or Vladimir Vladimirovich, is not just stable. We see it, okay? Nobody stable would make these threats. And he's threatened. Now, the other thing is, uh, they say, okay, if the NATO helps uh, more explicitly uh, Ukraine, okay, he will use nuclear weapons. But he's threatened over sanctions. Someone who threatens, why would he threaten over sanctions? So either he's telling you it doesn't make a difference. Okay, I, I'm going to use them. Anyway. You see, I want to commit suicide. So you got you got to uh, realize that it's actually an encouragement for NATO to help more explicitly. And then I understand why Ukraine doesn't ask for NATO's help for uh, Poland. Take hey, bring your uh, you know just like Russia came in. You, you're welcome in. This is a uh, you know you're my guest. Bring your soldiers and bring your uh, tanks. You, you, you get the idea. So I, I don't. I don't know if he's acting very rationally there, and uh, and I don't know how how Russia is built for uh, uh, you know uh, the coup and, and military coup. But visibly, he's sitting so far from his advisors that something's going on. Okay. Yeah. But also I admire, of course, Zelensky. <laughs> Without him, uh, this wouldn't have. I mean, nothing. <laughs> This enthusiasm for Ukraine wouldn't have happened. Yeah, thank you. I think the whole world now is admiring him for that. Uh, there is a question related to your uh, lecture. So one person, yes. Patrick Cleary, Cleary, he asks, how can we build an anti-fragile security agreement that provides security to smaller nations, but also I don't know if threaten? I don't know if you should use anti-fragile here in that context. Anti-fragile, as I said, is a limited concept of things that like variability up to a point, and uh, and don't uh, don't that. So something anti-fragile in agreement is an agreement that has adaptation with some tension on both sides that get small tensions that get neutralized rather than big tension once in a while. Okay, that would be more of a fragile. Let's call it fragile versus robust. Let's forget the anti-fragile thing. Okay. Uh, another uh, another idea I want to talk about is that in in my book Skin and Game, which is the last uh, installment of the Inserto, I spoke about Skin and Game. How people uh, how systems only work and operate well if if those who create risk also take that risk. And and I compared Zelensky, all right, in <laughs> out there exposed to Russian bombs, to Putin in his, uh, I don't know, bunker basement, pushing buttons and uh, and yelling at advisors who sit far away from him. So you get the idea. Putin can push any button. He's not the one dying, but Zelensky is. And uh, and in Skin and Game, I explained why this fascinates people. The the reason the Christ is loved uh, we're by, okay, kept coming back, uh, the Christ is man. And for us, the Orthodox Church, uh, particularly, not God, because God would be playing video games, right? But he really took risks and died. Okay, so he is God, but he suffered like a like a human. So this idea of taking risks, having skin in the game. So Christ has skin in the game. 
and, and this is why and he was killed for his whatever he did and that made him uh, elevated him to a uh, uh, of course to, to to the idea of, uh, to, to to what we uh, what happened and the same thing happened to another mediterranean okay uh, four centuries earlier uh, socrates <sighs> okay had socrates not been put to death i don't know if we would be talking about it okay so but a lot of uh, so the, these things the idea of, of of having skin in the game fascinates us humans and in the past, uh, unlike Mr. Putin sitting in his thing, and Zelensky is closer to Roman emperors, were always in battle. You see, the, the, of, or, uh, the, they were generals, of course, and uh, many were killed on a Prussian, uh, not Prussian, on a, on a, on a Persian fr front. So th this is why, I mean, what Zelensky did is vastly deeper than, than, than you can... Uh, Imagine from, from 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 the outset, he did something central. Is he put his skin in the game as a leader, when all other leaders on the planet don't have skin in the game? Yeah, just like many ordinary Ukrainians as well, I think it can explain uh, their behavior uh, too. Um, so, I see that there is one question which appears in different forms in chats. Uh, and on Facebook as well. So people are fascinated with um, with this concept of post-traumatic growth. And even though yeah. you have already you know, explained it, people still ask you <laughs> to repeat some key ideas of it. So what would be a combination, okay. you know, how to develop it? What what are the key points? No, no, the, the, whole, to... the whole point is to say that, that the stressor that you're gonna get uh, is not just a stressor that is, uh, um, good for you but it's something needed you see that that, that that it's something needed for your growth because i mean we humans never had a peace in history we always had stressors it's not till recently that we had this post-war uh, you know uh, quiet period i see um and i will i really want to ask one question for myself um I study Ukrainian society as a sociologist, and I know from the scholarship, from the literature, that for many years, many scholars and many pundits and journalists basically complained that Ukrainian society used to have this malfunction in institutions. You know, government didn't work well, but at the same time, uh, individual um, individuals uh, collaborated, uh, um, civil society was uh, quite strong. So you see that Ukraine has very bad hierarchy, but very good horizontal uh, connections. And a lot of people thought that this is kind of bad because our markets don't develop well, our democracy does not develop well. However, right now, in the face of war, it seems that no, this yes. is exactly what saves us. Yeah, so this is a huge disorganized horizontal um, connections between so many people who volunteer, help each other, fight with the enemy on the ground. So do you have any reflections on how to build a balance between, you know, building a strong, capable government, but at the same time be yeah. fluid? Exactly, Timothy, this is exactly what I, uh, uh, you know, uh, working on, okay? A lot of libertarians think that government's always bad. And I tell you that uh, there's things you can't do without government. Even Hayek accepted that government should be there for uh, wars and pandemics. Even, uh, what's his name, uh, von Mises. You have all these anti-war people. Von Mises was in favor of the military draft against Hitler. <laughs> okay, von Mises. All right. So uh, so, so the way we got to look at it is in terms of what I just discussed. The government should focus on protecting society from extremes. Having a strong military, having a well-organized thing to deal with pandemics, having okay, and then the rest of the things you deal with it, rather than the reverse. So what happens with uh, a lot of uh, governments is that they start nitpicking on small little things, trying to fix stuff that already works, okay, and and rather than focus on uh, big adverse uh, events. So, but but if you go back to Adam Smith, uh, nobody is anti-government. Even von Mises himself said, I don't see government as necessary evil. I don't even see it as an evil, okay? Okay, government is government for a function, just like everything has a function. 
and, and, okay, but you should not, the government should be in places where it's needed, uncontrovertibly, un where it requires some kind of uh, uh, collective action versus individual action. There's a lot of literature on that. And, and uh, what happened with, under the Soviet, and, and it actually started with the French, trying to regulate everything that doesn't need to be regulated. And and and, uh, and and do the reverse from things that are important. But I'm seeing it now in Lebanon. You have total breakdown of government, and you have uh, municipalities are much better at maintaining social order. So small is beautiful, and a bottom-up uh, system built like Switzerland, for example, mm -hmm. works beautifully. Although I, I would feel choked in Switzerland with too many rules. Uh, but these rules come from the bottom. They come from the community. They don't come from someone in a centralized uh, Soviet uh, style. Uh, incidentally, I always keep using the term Soviet Harvard illusion. Soviet Harvard, like you can direct some things. So the government should be there to, to allow the functioning of markets, provide you with a very good legal system. This is where you need the government, the good legal system. And rather than regulate, allow people to sue one another. The, the, that, I discussed that in Skin in the Game, but but I agree with you that uh, uh, most societies will do better in, in many things just uh, in organic collaborations for some things, but not others. Yeah. You don't want the absence of government. Let me tell you what it leads to. And I saw it in Lebanon. You see it in many places. You even saw it in the United States with the, uh, the mafia uh, rule. Warlords and mafia rule. We see it I mean, even in Russia. I mean, Russia is a combination of oligarchy and uh, <laughs> and a, a centralized uh, government. Sometimes they coexist. You have a mafia rule, uh, you know, that becomes legit in some places in the lives of the government rather than just a pure benign uh, democracy as of the type we have in the Anglo-Saxon world and most of Western Europe. Yeah. Um, I also noticed that several people, for some reason, uh, try to push you and uh, say something about uh, Pinker and his ideas about, uh, you know, world peace and safety. Okay. In... No, we, we, we debunk them. Pinker is not a scholar. He's a journalist. He doesn't understand the difference between statistically significant, uh, uh, the statistically significant and uh, the, uh, the factual. So, so in that sense, I wouldn't pay attention to Pinker because he doesn't understand elementary statistical properties. He said, oh, violence has dropped. Look, we have this data set. And our response to Pinker is that it's fat tail process to claim that violence has dropped. The inter-arrival rate of wars, such as World War II, is something like 102 years, 10 years, something like that. So you can't really proclaim it based on, oh, we have evidence there's no war. Look, there was a, haven't been any war for a few years. We had a period between Napoleon and the First War where you had no wars in Europe. Okay, and then suddenly it exploded. So I wouldn't, so the problem with Pinker is methodological. So a scholar can be wrong, okay, but here it's not even a level of scholarship because uh, if you, when you write a scientific paper, you have to use a methodology to say this is statistically significant. And the properties of war are such that statistically significant means a much longer period of peace. Yes, well, this is but, a message also to all our students who are listening. Please use proper methodology. Um, use and, proper methodology, exactly. I mean, don't use thin tail process for fat tail process. Another way people use thin tail mistake for fat tail is when they say, well, Ebola or you know killed only two people. So therefore, it's risk-free compared to heart attacks. Well, heart attacks are uh, thin-tailed. They don't double from year to year, but uh, pandemics can be multiplied by 100. And sure enough, we use that at the beginning of the pandemic, where they said, you know, uh, you have higher risk of drowning in your swimming pool than uh, dying of COVID. Well, that was at the beginning, but COVID has properties so unstable that you cannot really make an inference based on the same sample uh, size methodology. It's not Gaussian. So that's sort of like what I focus on. In this, you can download the PDF and uh, uh, yeah. it has cartoons in it, all right? Oh yeah, people in the chat already shared all the links. They, are, uh, they have self-coordinated. 
Um, I, I think it will be the last question because we don't want to take a lot of your time. Um, there is also a demand in the chat. People are interested in in sanctions. Can you reflect from you know from your position whether sanctions to Russia can be treated as a stress that will make them stronger, or if this is something okay, a mild else? sanction like the sanction that happened last time effectively made some sectors stronger in Russia. Like uh, someone went to Italy, bought cows or something, start making mozzarella because they will sell mozzarella, something like that, right? So mild sanction, drastic sanction, uh, destroy a country. Particularly that we could, a country today cannot live in autarky. You see, globalization is there to stay, some degree of globalization, and and you exclude people from financial markets. They cannot export goods. Uh, and then you have a voluntary sanction, like uh, American companies that don't want to buy from Russia, and uh, uh, technology uh, people making chips that don't want to sell to Russia. So, so you end up having really crippling the place. Now, whether the the average Russian uh, whose uh, firstborn son is enlisting in the army will understand that this is not meant, you know, to punish you because you you know they may react by getting angry at the west but 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 to make you uh, rebel against the kremlin okay i i'm not sure i mean something got to be done in, you know in in marketing the idea to russians that that we love you but we don't like uh, your government something that was not communicated early very well early on very well with the iranians yeah. hey we love we love we love russians but we we hate the kremlin <laughs> It's, so uh, got to come with that and they we're not punishing you we're punishing putin and he's punishing you so it's putin doing that to you not us so, so you have to also uh, uh, psychologically uh, uh, frame it in a way for people to uh, to to not you know resent the west but but definitely uh, the sanctions of the type we have now definitely uh, would be serious okay yeah, thank you. So I, I think we're running out of time. The questions also start to repeat themselves. And um, the, I, I want to say to our viewers that please uh, follow uh, Key School of Economics on Twitter, uh, on Facebook. We will have more uh, guest speakers uh, for solidarity. But I want to say a special thank you to Professor Taleb because he was thank the you first very much. one. And, and, I, and I pledge to come to the Ukraine when I can. Uh, I've been there many times. I was there last summer to come back and uh, and maybe uh, you know. Uh, uh, we will greet you on the streets of peaceful Kiev, and we will share food and drinks. So yeah, I love, I love, I love Kiev. I, love, I will tell you, I went there. I've been there four times. Well, we will wait you more <laughs> for fifth and sixth and seventh. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, very much. Uh, Thanks. Enjoy your day. Bye bye. Bye now. Thank you all who joined.